Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is the West Block, politics, perspectives, and players. Another stunning week here in Ottawa as the opposition accused the Prime Minister's office of a cover-up and are demanding that former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould be allowed to speak freely when she testifies at the Justice Committee next week. There was also gobsmacking testimony at that same committee from the country's most powerful bureaucrat, who backed the Liberals. All this comes on the heels of the resignation of the Prime Minister's own principal secretary, Gerald Butts, who left in the wake of the scandal. I remember the first time the Prime Minister asked me to be in Cabinet. I'm sure you remember that. It would be a momentous occasion. In that conversation with the Prime Minister, did he mention the issues with respect to SNC-Lavalin and the difficulties that he was facing? He did not. Will she be allowed to speak her truth? We are doing our best. I am doing my best as Attorney General. Uh, to find a way for that to happen. I'm here to say to you that the Globe and Mail article contains errors, unfounded speculation, and in some cases is simply defamatory. That was Conservative Lisa Raitt and NDP member Murray Rankin questioning Attorney General David Lametti at the Justice Committee last week, plus Privy Council Clerk Michael Wernick criticizing the Globe and Mail. Joining me to unpack the politics of the crisis surrounding the Prime Minister's office right now is Toronto Star Bureau Chief Susan Delacourt and the Globe and Mail's Bureau Chief Bob Fife. Bob, this has been your story all along. Your reaction to the top bureaucrat in the country coming out and saying that parts of your story verged almost on defamation. Well, you know, in politics, the best offense is a strong offense and to go after and shoot the messenger. But in fact, the testimony confirmed the Globe and Mail's reporting. We reported that there was pressure applied to Miss Wilson Rabo to do a deferred prosecution agreement with SNC Lavalin. We never said that anybody directed her to do so, but there was pressure applied. He agreed that there was pressure applied, but he said it was not inappropriate pressure. What's the best thing about Mr. Warnick's uh, testimony before the House of Commons Committee was that we now know a lot more than we publicly than we knew before. And it's not anonymous sources, it's the clerk saying there were all of these meetings right up until December 19th from the Prime Minister and Mr. Warnick and other senior members of the Prime Minister staff trying to get Ms. wilson Rabel to order the Director of Public Prosecutions to shelve the SNC prosecution. So clearly there's pressure. Where's the line between pressure and inappropriate pressure? Well, the clerk said that that is a matter for the Ethics Commissioner to sort out. But I think the next thing we have to hear is Jody Wilson-Raybould's version of what pressure is. Do you think they're going <clears> to <throat> let her speak, Susan? I don't know. That, that was a very complicated part of his testimony, because he said it's just his opinion, not his advice, that she doesn't have solicitor-client privilege. Um, that uh, it is also true that as a member of the House of Commons, I just learned this this week too, or remembered it, I should not say, uh, she can stand up in the House of Commons and she has parliamentary immunity. She mm. can say whatever she wants. And she's said she wants uh, to actually, speak with her. Uh, my understanding that parliamentary immunity doesn't cover solicitor-client privilege. That's, that's, uh, that's according to some lawyers that I've talked to about that. So. I think uh, you saw David Lametti late in the week, not even at committee, but he, he seems to go a little bit farther each day, the Attorney General saying, we're, we're getting there. First it was, I have to review it, then it was, I may review it, and he said on Friday, we're getting there, we're trying to make sure that she can speak. Well, so I mean, I the, would... clerk, the clerk said he didn't think uh, sister client privilege applied in this particular case, and she should be able to speak. Yeah. Now, she has retained a former Supreme Court Justice, mm -hmm. Thomas Cromwell, highly respected jurist and, and lawyer. He will give her the best advice. We hope, I hope, that she is allowed to tell her side of the story, because I think it's clear there are two interpretations. She is of the view that once the in independent prosecutor has made a decision to go ahead with a prosecution, does not, the, 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 in the, based on law, and, and the law uh, was, including the deferred prosecution law, was that you cannot uh, 
give a company a break because of economic interest. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is what they kept presenting to her over and over, according right. to the clerk. Right. Well, then, but they were also trying to tell her, look, okay, maybe that's the case, but you've got to get a panel of outside experts on deferred prosecutions, and they'll come up with an explanation for this, and then you can Find override away. the independent prosecutor. But but I think, Susan, our point is, is that we, 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 we want to hear her side of the story. Yeah, yeah. And then Canadians, I, as Mr. Carr said, Canadians will make up their minds, because there are are, there are two equally valid positions. And there are, I think, the, the clerk's testimony, which was, we were talking about this, just riveting television. Uh, the clerk's position, or the way he laid it out was, there was a lot more going on in Cabinet than just this issue. And I think we've seen it. There was apparently a, quite an epic battle over Indigenous justice. Mm -hmm. um, and some hints to that in speeches she gave, that she wasn't very happy right, with the government. That's right, which Bob reported in the original story. So I think we're starting to see the side of the story where this cabinet minister, the anonymous reports again on the other side was problematic. We're starting to see the problems were not just on this. They were for some cabinet members larger. And I thought it was interesting the way the clerk also defended Carolyn Bennett <clears throat> and came out so strongly. And she and Jody Wilson Raybord apparently did not get along. Yes, and we can see that now. And we can see that these weren't that wasn't just a um, a personality difference. There was a, apparently a huge policy so difference. You know, one of the things that I liked about this whole, now that they pulled back the curtain, now you see how things really operate in this town. <laughs> yeah. Big, powerful corporation mounts a massive lobbying campaign that gets the Prime Minister on side, Quebec Premier's on side, the clerk on side, and they've got a stubborn Attorney General who won't cave and and up until December 19th, up until Christmas, she wasn't going to cave, and there's an opportunity for a cabinet shuffle, and she is moved, and we have a Montreal MP who's riding his right adjacent to uh, the... What a coincidence. Uh, you know, uh, and then Mr. Warnick said, well, this, this shows, because she didn't do this, show the system worked. No, the system was supposed to work in, in SNC Lavalin's favor. One question we don't know the answer to, and it was all overshadowed the minute Jody Wilson-Raybould walked at a cabinet and all of our jaws collectively dropped. It was like the Bobby uh, Ewing moment in Dallas. Well, who would have thought this could be over, overshadowed by anything? But Jerry Butts resigned, the yes, Prime Minister's principal right. secretary. He says he did nothing wrong. So why did he resign then? I think that is the big unanswered question at the end of a very strange week. I wouldn't be surprised to see Jerry Butts walk into Cabinet next week, the way things have been going. Um, I hear there but, might be an open seat in Cape Breton, so... Um, uh, yeah, that would be a demotion for him, too, so I... Um, I think we've got to find out that because, you know, there were all these suggestions that Gerald Butts offered up his head to do reconciliation with Jody Wilson-Raybould. I did not see Ms. Wilson-Raybould in a particular conciliatory mood in the Commons in the wake of that. She stood up and said, I want to speak my truth. It looked like she was still kind of this whatever burning issue is still burning and Jerry Butts is now gone and I think the story we're going to have to look at next week is how is this government reorganizing itself around somebody who is so central when you talked about the center in this government you were talking about Gerald Butts and Katie Telford well, Katie yeah, Telford's still there but Gerald Butts is gone Susan is right is that they they need uh, somebody to come in now we've we've heard uh, our the our ambassador to Washington, David McNaughton, has a possibility, but they he need somebody it, yeah. to come in to get that place reorganized. I have to ask, Jugmeet Singh, is he going to win in the by-election tomorrow? I think yes he's going to no? win. I think he's going to win, and he's going to win. Once he gets to the House of Commons, he's going to be sorry he won. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to ask him that question. Thank you very much to our journals for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. That's all the time we have for today. For more politics from the West Block, please visit our website, thewestblock.ca, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And of course, don't forget to check out our podcast, which is available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. For the West Block, I'm Mercedes Stevenson.